Well, God bless you. Everybody okay? Yes. Well, you're actually better than you think. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you're translocational this morning. You're seated in heavenly places with Christ and sitting right there. That's pretty good, isn't it? Now, what we've got to realize is that everything God's done, he's done to show us how good he is. He's a good, good God. My favorite verse in the whole Bible is Nahum chapter 1, verse 7. Nahum chapter 1, verse 7 says, God is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those that are trusting him. I'm so thankful it didn't say God was good or he's going to be good. He is. Present tense, right now in the middle of your mess, he's good. And I'm telling you, he's offering himself to you today. He's giving us an invitation none of us can afford to turn down. It's Revelations 4.1. It says, after this, I heard a voice which said, come up here. And I looked. And there was a door standing open in heaven. And I heard a voice which said, come up here. I am telling you, God is offering us an invitation to draw near. To draw near. It's pretty amazing. Don't you love Jesus? Jesus Jesus Christ walked up to me one time and said, Bobby, I want you to study Song of Solomon. I said to him, I don't get nothing out of that book. (laughs) Now that's about as dumb as you can get. The living son of God say to you, I want you to study a portion of my word. And you say to him, I don't get nothing out of that book. But that's what I said. Now his next, his next phrase stunned me. He said, you don't know nothing about kissing, do you boy? Now I'm not lying. This is what Jesus Christ said to me. I said to him, apparently not. Jesus Christ taught me three things about mouth kissing. This is out of Song of Solomon. Number one, to mouth kiss, you have to be really close. Number two, you have to be face to face. Number three, mouth mouth kissing is the most stimulating preparatory act before intimacy. No wonder the Song of Solomon says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. His mouth is altogether lovely. Wow. So I dove into the Song of Solomon. Wow. Did you know they almost didn't put it in the Bible? Because of the language that it is. It's a love language between you and, and, and Jesus. And it almost didn't get in there because of how, how lively it is, how passionate it is. But I'll tell you what, if you want to know a little bit about times and seasons, talk about times and seasons, I'm going to be down in uh, San Diego this week doing a conference on times and seasons with Jeremy Nelson and Miranda and those guys down there in uh, San Diego. But anyway, a, 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 a conference on times and seasons. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 says, there's a time and a season and purpose for every activity of God under heaven. There's a time, a season, purpose, and activity for, from God. God wants us to know his times and his seasons. In it first, first Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says, we need to operate under the anointing of the sons of Issachar. It said they had understanding of the times to know what the people of God should be doing. So we're no, we shouldn't be going around, oh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be walking in the light as he is in the light. Walking with goal, aim, and true purpose, the Bible says. But Uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad God's here. I'm glad he wants to do uh, something to merge us together. So you ought to study Song of Solomon. Uh, Here's what he's going to do for us. He's going to drive us out from under the fig tree to the apple tree. One of the most intimate verses in the whole Bible is what happens to us when we get with him under the apple tree. Now, those of you that are Bible students, you can look up Song of Solomon chapter 2. We're coming out from under the fig tree to the apple tree. And it tells us where he puts his hands on his bride. So it's pretty interesting. That's not what I'm talking about today, but uh, I just thought I'd <laughs> warm up and start that away. It's okay to walk around, isn't it? Yes. All right, so here we go. Everything going good? good? Did you get home with that big dessert last night? I did. Oh, man, I did too. I'm, uh, mm. uh, yeah, we did. Just as soon as the school was over yesterday, uh, uh, Pastor said, do you want to go get a steak? And I said, yes, you know. So I, I was definitely in on that. Uh, I can prove to you God never intended for us to be vegan. Now, some of you may be, but uh, that's your choice. You see these canine teeth right there? If God wanted to eat grass, he'd be flat. (laughs) I can prove to you from the Bible. Now, if you want to be a vegan, you can. But I can prove to you from the Bible that's not the will of God. (laughs) Book of Acts says, rise up, kill and eat. (laughs) Now, I never heard anybody slew a cabbage. No, it's okay. That, That doesn't make any difference about that. 
Uh, anyway, some of you are going, oh man, don't, 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 listen, it's going to be okay. I don't know why people get so stiff in church. I'll tell you, some people have just enough Jesus to be miserable. They got him in the head, but not the heart. They don't know anything about his love. They're trying to live a legalistic life instead of a love life. He loves you. He longs, he wants, can you imagine that? He knows every bad thing you've done and still loves you. Your friends won't. He knows every bad thing you've ever done and still loves you. Wow. Wow. Your friends, if they find a little dirt on you, they'll distance themselves. But when Jesus sees you struggling, he draws near. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I hope you'll visit the book table. I really mean that. And that's what I've got these two books in my hands to remind me to talk about them. But anyway, uh, here's one called Legacy and Lineage Line. Uh, the, we wrote this uh, book a few years ago and the copy sold out by the tens of thousands. And so the Lord said, I want you to uh, revise this thing and amplify it. So I rewrote the thing. Boy, I got in trouble with God over this book. The Lord said, I'm, uh, he said, I want you to go up and start announcing somebody's going to write a book about legacy lineage line and help guide and navigate a generation. So I guess maybe four years, I went up and down the land saying, somebody's going to write a book about legacy lineage line and going to help navigate a, a generation. Nobody picked it up. Finally, my wife, Carolyn, said, Bobby, I believe God's talking to you about writing that book. So I said, God, you want me to write that book? And he said, yes, I do. It came like a, like a torrent. Whoom! The book came just like that. Boy, I was working on it. Da, 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 da. Then I got busy. I usually go a couple of places a week doing ministry. So I got really busy, man. So I'd push Legacy and Lineage Line to the back, and I'm driving to the airport one day, and Jesus Christ said, hey, Bobby, how's your Legacy and Lineage Line book coming? Now, you, 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 you can snow a lot of people, but not Jesus. <laughs> so I said to him, well, um, I've got really busy and I've kind of pushed it on the back burner. The Lord said to me in a tone filled with total authority, I intend for you to shut down some meetings, get in a solitude place and finish Legacy and Lineage Line. I canceled some meetings. I went down to a cabin we have for writing and secluded and finished the first, first edition of this. They sold out like you couldn't imagine. Then the Lord said, I want you to amplify this. I want you to put in here how people can break off ancestral curses and how they can amplify the blessings of God in their descendants from now on. Here's what the Bible said, Psalms. Say Psalms. Psalms. 112 verse 2. Here's what it says. The offspring of the upright shall be mighty in the earth. Here's your verse about your children. You want it? Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. God speaking. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and they will spring up like willows by a riverbank. If you're hungry, you're thirsty, you're desperate, your children will flourish. You need to get the book on. See, you understand you're forging the future your grandchildren will live in. Yeah. That's, that's the privilege you have. You're forging the future your grandchildren will live in. It says this, that if you're hungry and thirsty and desperate, your children flourish. That's a nice thing, isn't it? So legacy and lineage line, you, well, you, I want you to get it. It tells you how to be a priest over your family, how you put your hands on your descendants. I don't care if they're 40 years old, you still have authority over them in them in the spirit realm. And you can command the blessing of God in their life. I'm telling you, it says train up a child in the way they go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. You can call them back in from waywardness. I heard a clamorous crowd of people once. I said, God, who is that clamorous crowd? He said, that's the prodigals coming back to a festive feast in Father's house. That's who it is. Anyway, so there's that one. Here's this. There's that. Now watch this. For 23 years on the Day of Atonement, I have a visitation from Jesus Christ. I want to stop just right there. Let that sink in a moment. For 23 years, on the Day of Atonement, I've had a visitation from Jesus Christ. He'll tell me some of the things that's going to happen in the future. I write in a book called The Shepherd's Rod. This is the one for 2018. I am telling you, I think it could be one of the most uh, transformational ones we've written. He told me, he said, it's the season of the ring and the robe. He said, I'm going to shift my people from, from servants to sons. This is, what, this is a year we're going to learn more about son, sonship than we've known our whole life. 1 John 3, 3, 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3 says, behold, behold. And it means 
Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Romans 8, 19 said the whole creation, that's everything, the whole creation, that's principalities, powers, angels, the whole creation is groaning and travailing, wanting us to step into our true identity. I'd suggest it's time for the church to get over self-imposed amnesia. What? Self-imposed amnesia. We need to shake ourselves and find out who we are. Galatians says you are heir of everything. <laughs> Hebrews 1, beginning starting Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 6 says, He, Jesus Christ, is the lawful owner of all the universe. And now he says, because you're his son, you're joint heirs with him. Wow, how big of a state is that? <laughs> We've got to shake ourselves and realize God wants us to understand sonship. I'll tell you what the message of sonship will do. It'll drive off an orphan spirit. An orphan spirit has hobbled and crippled the church. We're children of the most high God. We need to understand who God says that we are. Revelations 1, 5 and 6 says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and has made us to be priests and kings. Wow. It says the word, the word of a king carries power and authority. Who can stop what he says? That's pretty wild, isn't it? So we'll have a book signing after this is over. I never used to sign books. The Lord came to me and said, don't you sign books? I said, uh, I don't sign books. He said, you do now. <laughs> this is honest to God truth. So I told my wife, I said, we're having a book signing. She said, I didn't know we signed books. I said, we do now. <laughs> First book I ever signed. I'm out there at a the book table and I knew my name, so I signed it. The lady is standing in front of me. I said, what is your name? She said, Donna. I said, is that D-O-N-N-A? And she said, that's correct. So I took my pen, I'm writing D-O-N-N-A. When the pen made the last stroke of the A, a Bible passage drifted across my spirit just like that. So I thought, I'll write it down. I'm writing the passage down, she's watching it. When I finish the passage, she falls on the floor. She starts screaming, <laughs> hyperventilating, going, ah, that's it. That's the verse my mother used to train me with. We've seen a guy 40 years stone deaf, healed at the book table. God grew a guy a finger at the book table, and I was joking. Guy walked up and cut his finger off with a, a saw trying to make a cabinet. And I said, you know, God's got original parts and God grew my finger. Yeah. Look out now. So anyway, who'll read this book? This, this is, you, you will? Now don't lie to me, I'm prophetic. I'll, I'll shake you up. It'll shake you up if you'll read it. Yeah. Do you know where your descendants came from? Do you know where your descendants came from? Where? Levitical priesthood. Levitical priesthood. I'll tell you what, when I walked by you, the Lord said, tell her to study her ancestral line. There's some trophies in your ancestral line, okay? So I'd suggest you study it. Don't you think? Yeah. Aren't you glad we've been translated out of one family into another? Yeah. Colossians what? Colossians 1 uh, says he, he takes us out of the family of darkness and puts us in the family of love and light. Aren't you glad of that? So here's what I want to talk about this morning. Y'all got plenty of time? My plane don't leave till in the morning. I think you're wonderful. That's what I think about you. What you doing? You doing good? Oh, aren't they something? Man, I know, guys, I, know, I know guys in Texas can gut a deer and can't change a diaper. <laughs> I can change a diaper and can't gut a deer. Yeah, yeah. i tell you what happened. Uh, my oldest son is 54, and back then they had real diapers. They got them things that look like a sandwich wrapper now. You know what I mean? <laughs> back then they were the real stuff. You had to pin them on. I mean, it was a blood sacrifice. <laughs> Somebody's going to bleed, you know. Oh, man. You know, you had to do something with them. I dropped them in the toilet until my wife got home. That's what I do with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're wonderful. That's how the birds go. Do you know the Holy Spirit in that baby is the same size as the Holy Spirit in you? Yeah, only purer. That's really true. They, they can see God a lot quicker than you can. Jesus said, except you become like a little child, you cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. 
Religion's always trying to grow you up. God wants us to digress in order to advance. We've got to quit being childlike, childish and start being childlike. Childish is my church, my ministry, my job. Childlike is just believing God can do anything. So here's what I want to talk to you about today, okay? Yeah. All right. I'm getting back up here so I can use this book. I'm going to show you one of the most baffling verses I've found in a long time. You want to see it? Yes. Now, here's what I'm going to talk about this morning. You know I'm a fashion icon. <laughs> so here's what God, God told me. He said, I want you to announce that the body of Christ has suffered a wardrobe malfunction. That's what he told me. Just straight out, just like I told you. Tell the body of Christ they've suffered a wardrobe malfunction. Now, you can Google it, not now, and find out what a wardrobe malfunction is. Too much flesh being exposed. Now, the body of Christ, that's you and me, have suffered a wardrobe malfunction. And so, too much flesh being exposed. So, now, down there in Hollywood, when they have those uh, red carpets, you, you've seen them. I, I, you, you've seen them. There's some chick out there in a sli- shiny dress. Some guy will walk up with a microphone. He'll poke it under her nose. And the first question he asks is what? Who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? You heard them? Who are you wearing? Well, that's what the Holy Ghost is asking you today. He's got the microphone under your mouth going, who are you wearing? I'll tell you, all the best dressed Christians are going to be wearing Jesus. I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. I'm going to show it to you in the Bible. You want to see it? Say it. Yes, Bobby. Bobby. Now take your Bible. Go with me to Judges chapter 6. Say where? Where? Judges chapter 6. Now, if you've studied Judges, oh, man, the last verse in the last book, chapter of the book of Judges, it says, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes, and Israel was far from God. Wow. So it's not a real stimulating book. But look, I'll start with verse 1 to kind of set the stage. You ready? Yes, here we go. Today I'll be reading from Judges chapter 6, verse 1, out of the Amplified Classic Version of the Bible. Here we go. But the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Verse 2, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The Israelites made themselves dens, uh, caves, which are in the mountains, and caves and strongholds. Verse 3, for whenever Israel had sown their seed, the Midianites and the Amalekites, Let's stop and find out who in the world are those two guys. The word, word Midian, the Midian, the word Midian is a Hebrew word that means strife and contention. How do you like them running over you, ruling over you? That's who Israel was being overrun by, was people full of strife and contention, the Midianites. And then we find these Amalekites. The word Amalekite means raider and robbers. And Israel had done evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord turned them over to be ruled over by these kind of people. Look what's happened. Verse 3, for whenever Israel would sow, their seed, the Midianites, the Amalekites, uh, and the people from the east would come barging in. Verse 4 says, they would encamp against them and destroy the crops as far as Gaza and leaving no nourishment for Israel, for their donkeys or their sheep or anything. Verse 5, for they came up with their cattle and with their tents, and they came like locusts for multitudes. Both they and their camels could not be counted. So they wasted the land as they entered into it. All right, verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and Israel cried to the Lord. I told the people last night, uh, yesterday in the school, what the word cried, and they cried to the Lord. It means they screamed in agony and anguish. Uh, let me read it. And when, when Israel screamed in agony and anguish to the Lord, verse 8, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israel who said to them, Thus saith the Lord God, the God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and out of the forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hands of all those that oppressed you and go, drove them out from before you and saved you from their land. And look what it says, verse 10, And I said to you, Do this, 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 and They had said, but you've not obeyed me. So they're in a terrible mess, aren't they? Now, I I want us to meet a character in the book of Judges. His name is Gideon. Say Gideon. Gideon. Gideon is a strange word. 
Uh, it's a word for a warrior. If you, if you look at the Hebrew word Gideon, it means feller, F-E-L-L-E-R, feller. And here's a, here's a scene. You see an enemy charging towards you. You see a man with a big broad sword and he swings at the enemy like this and the sword penetrates to the enemy. One piece falls here and one piece falls here. Gideon, feller, one that cuts the enemy in half. Every time his dad would call him, Gideon, it means victorious warrior that slices the enemy in half. But Gideon never understood who he was. Look, look, what, look what he says. Well, we'll just fast forward here. And verse um, uh, 10 says, and I, I say to you, the Lord God is with you. Verse 11, now the angel of the Lord came and sat down on the tree in Ophrim, which belongs to Joash, the Aborizonite. And his son Gideon was beating wheat in the wine press to hide from the Midianites. That's almost comical. Nobody in their right mind would sift wheat in a wine vat. You sift wheat out on a mountainside so the wind will blow the chaff away, but he's hiding because he's afraid. He's beating out just enough to get a loaf or two of bread. And watch this. It says the capital A, angel of the Lord. This is pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Pre-incarnate Jesus Christ walks up to the wine vat and watch how he greets, watch how he, watch how he greets uh, 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 Gideon. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. Scared the, scared the spit out of Gideon. <laughs> There's Gideon down there, afraid he's gonna be mugged. And Jesus said, "How, oh, you victorious warrior. Wouldn't you like to have a heart monitor on Gideon? <laughs> but anyway, instead of Gideon go, yes, bless God, that's who I am. I'm victorious, I'm unstoppable, I'm invincible. Now, nah, look what he started doing. He started whining. Look there. And verse 13 says, and Gideon said to him, oh, sir, Oh, sir, if the Lord is with us, why is all of this befalling us? And where are all of his wonderful works in which our fathers told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of the land of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of Midian. And verse 14 said, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this your might, and you will save Israel from the hand of Midianite. Have I not sent you? And look at verse 15. And Gideon said to him, Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. <laughs> How can I deliver Israel? Behold, my clan is the poorest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Wait a minute. Almighty God, creator of the universe, has said, you are an unstoppable warrior. And he goes, sir, you're mistaken. I am from the tribe of Manasseh. Look up the Hebrew word Manasseh. It means that one that causes you to forget and relent. Manasseh. That one that causes you to have poor perception of who you really are. I'm from Manasseh, and besides that, Manasseh is the smallest tribe in all of Israel. And besides that, my family is the poorest family in the tribe of Manasseh. And besides that, I'm the wussiest one in my family. <laughs> That's what he says. We got an identity crisis, don't you think? Now, I'm going to show you what changes that. You ready? Now I'm going to that mysterious verse. Fast forward over there, Judges 6, 34. All right. Remember the question is, who you wearing? Judges 6, 34. But the Spirit of God clothed Gideon with himself and took possession of him. And he, Gideon, blew a trumpet, and the clan of Abers was gathered unto him. But look, look at that verse. It's unbelievable. But God clothed Gideon with God. Question is, who you wearing? But God clothed Gideon with God and took possession of him. Question is, who you wearing? The body of Christ has suffered a more wardrobe malfunction. They can't see. God, they see too much flesh, the world around us. So, wouldn't it be great if we could just say, oh God, here we go. I want you to clothe me with you. It ain't gonna happen. That's not the regime right now. God, I, I'm screaming in <laughs> I don't like preachers that mumble and apologize for nearly saying something. You need to say what you believe and believe what you say or sit down. Don't you think? 
I'm so sick of these super seeker friendly guys. I don't want to, I don't want to rock the boat. Hey, let's turn it over and see who wants back in. We ought to turn the boat over and see who wants. So here's the question. If God's not going to clothe us with God, how are we going to get our right apparel? Here it is. You ready? Romans. Oh, I'm s- Romans. <laughs> 13, verse 14, Romans 13, verse 11 said, that knowing what a critical hour this is, how that it's high time to wake out of slumber, rouse to reality. Final salvation is nearer now than when we first believed it here, do trust it in Christ the Messiah. Verse 14 says, that's Romans 13, verse 14. What does it say? But clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Who's supposed to clothe you now? You are. What are you supposed to put on? Jesus. He won't get on a dirty vessel. He will not get on a dirty vessel. He won't do it. Ecclesiastes 9, 8 says, make sure. Ecclesiastes 9, 8. Make sure your head always has anointing on it, and your raiments are always white. If you're going to put on Jesus, you've got to have a clean vessel. Remember what Psalms, David said, create in me, God, a clean heart, O oh God. Renew in me a right spirit. Psalms 24, 3 and 4 says what? Psalms 24, 3 and 4 says what? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath what? Clean hands and a pure heart. So we better ask God to do something. Yeah. Judge our heart. You may say, oh, Bob, wait, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I've judged my heart. That's, you're incapable of doing that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says our hearts are so deep, so dark, so twisted, we can't know them. That's Jeremiah 17, 9. Who can then? Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord, examine the heart. Yeah. The Bible said in Samuel, man looks on the outside, God ponders The heart. We've got to get down to the heart of the matter. He said the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. We've got to deal with heart issues because if if there's contamination in our heart, we can't put on Jesus. So we've got to do that. Psalms 139 verse 23. What does that say, brother? Search me, O God, and know me. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in a way of eternal, everlasting. Don't you want him to lead you? Wouldn't it be awful to spend this whole life and then stand before God and say, I'm sorry, I never knew you. Wow. Wow. You know, it says, one said, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. In your name, we've done many wonderful things. He said, I'm sorry, didn't make the cut. Depart from me, work of iniquity. I never knew you. So how are we going to get cleaned up? I'm telling you, one of the missing messages in the church today is Holiness. But I'm telling you, the Bible says this, without holiness, no person's going to see the Lord. Is that what it says? That's what it says. Yeah. Yes. You want another verse about putting on Christ? Colossians 3.12. Put on Christ. Dress up with him. And it's the same word for rolling on a tunic. Dress up in Jesus. Who are you wearing? We We better be wearing Jesus now. Okay. I want to show you something. If we're going to get clean and pure, we're going to have to ask him to wash us. Isaiah 118 says, come on now, let's reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as white, scarlet, they can be as white as snow. He can clean us up on the inward man. Some of the best advice you'll ever find in the Bible is in the book of Ruth. Say Ruth. Ruth. In Ruth, chapter 3, verse 3, Naomi, who's a type of the Holy Spirit, talking to Ruth, who's a type of the church, She's, Naomi is on a mission and a mandate to get Ruth and Boaz connected. Boaz is a type of Jesus. Ruth is a type of church. Naomi is a type of Holy Spirit. Her mission and mandate is to get them connected. And so here's what's happening. In, in Ruth chapter 3, Naomi is instructing Ruth how to prepare herself to meet with Boaz. And here's what she says. She says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wash yourself. Ruth 3, 3, wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your raiment, and get down to the threshing floor. Wow. See, a lot of us want the throne room when we need the threshing floor. 
You can't go to the throne room till you first visit the threshing floor. What happens at the threshing floor? That's where all the husk is wanted away. And the heart of the matter is, is exposed. Meet me tonight at the threshing floor. So one thing I love in Ruth 3, 3, it says that Naomi's instructing Ruth, wash yourself, anoint you, say purity. I'm sure there's people in this room need to wash yourself. You've sat before filthy television. You don't have to look for pornography. Now, it's a predatory. It's looking for you. One wrong look can take your whole destiny away. Remember when, we better understand something. The devil wants you to crumble. Uh-huh. And he'll do everything he can to get that accelerated. You say, well, give me an example of that. Uh, here's one. There's a, the man in the Bible, is, uh, he wrote the biggest number of Psalms. And he, he had a testimony in the, Old, in the New Testament was, a man after God's own heart. Who was that? David. Here's what happened. It says, when it came time for kings to go to battle, David tarried still in Jerusalem. When it came time for kings to go to battle, David goes, mm, don't think I'm going. See, if you're not where you're supposed to be, there won't be any grace to be where you are. If you're not where you're supposed to be, there won't be any grace to be where you are. And it, it shows up the same way it showed up in David's life. Kings go out to battle. David stayed still in Jerusalem. And what happens? Discontentment. Dissatisfaction. He's restless, gets up off the bed, remember that? And decided he'd take a journey, a little walk on top of the palace. We're talking about there, if you've got that dissatisfaction, the devil will set up a delightful distraction. This is King David. This is a man after God's own heart. And he's walking upon the balcony. He hears somebody giggling. He looks over the roof and there in the hot tub is Bathsheba. Wow. It says he looked. Now, he could have went, ooh, but he went, ooh. In our, in our language, he just, he went back to the room and searched Facebook to see if he could find where that gal's from. That's where a lot of people fall right straight down into a trap. Yeah, you better watch out. The devil wants you to crumble. So what happened to man after God's own heart? It, that word look is the strongest word in the human language for lust. He looked upon her with a craving, and he sent his servants to go get her. Text that girl and see what she's doing tonight. He took her, had intercourse with her, got her pregnant, and what happened? Then he began to try to cover up his mess. He said, I'll get, her, I'll get Uriah in. I'll get him drunk. He'll go home, and he'll think this baby's his. But see, there is still some faithful people in the house of God. Uriah would not go have sex with his wife while his men were bleeding out on the battlefield, so he slept on the porch. God always has a way of exposing our sins. Whosoever covers his sins shall not prosper. We're talking about getting clean enough to put on Jesus. No wonder Psalmist David, after the prophet confronted him, thou art the man, then he's broken. Psalms 51. I dare you study Psalms 51. Every other psalm in the Bible is called poetic, poetic. It flows, but not Psalms 51. The theologians tell us what it's called. It's called ejaculatory. Have you ever ever tried to converse with somebody that's overrun with emotion? Maybe their trauma and tragedy has happened to their family. Maybe somebody's been tragically killed, and they're they're still trying to... That's the whole way Psalms 51 is written. If we would understand the tragedy and the trauma of a fallen life... He starts with Psalms 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness and your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquities. We're talking about how we're going to put on Jesus. We're going to have to start from the inside out. Create in me, Psalms 51, 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew in me a right spirit. How many of you need to cry that out today? Those of you who watch on media, how many of you realize you've looked at the wrong thing? Your heart has turned towards the wrong thing. You never intended it. I'm sure when David made that decision, not going, he never dreamed the fruit of not being where you're supposed to be. See, if you're not where you're supposed to be, no grace to be where you are. Wow. wow. I suggest if it could happen to David, it could happen to any of us. The Bible says, beware where you think you stand lest you fall. 
Don't you ever say, well, I've never, whoa, look at. Only by the grace of God is the way you can keep from it. So you say, now, Bobby, what are we talking about? We're talking about cleaning our lives up to the place we can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Who are we wearing? I want us to get so full of Jesus that his glory and his glow is up on our face. I think we ought to become a generation of Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. I want his glory to be seen. I want us to be so full of Jesus, he radiates from us. But it won't happen if we're living in sin. First thing happens when sin enters into your life, shame comes. Shame comes. And then your mouth is closed. You won't talk about the gospel when your heart's full of shame. Teach me thy way, O God. And then I'll teach transgressors your way. When you get back right with God, then there's that liberation to share about Jesus. Don't you want it? You say, oh, Bobby, I, you know, I've never been very good at witnessing. Well, shame on you. Acts 1 8 says, but you shall receive power after Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you will be a witness. That's not if you feel like it, that's commands. He don't give you the power without a purpose. You go, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of. No, let's get aggressive in soul winning. I guarantee you the devil is getting aggressive in pollution. So the church is going to have to ratchet it up. We're going to have to shake off. We're going to have to rouse to reality. I tell you what we've got to do. We've got to become more militant. Now, I don't want any. Uh, mm, mm. You better get out of church then. Can't you see there's a confrontation coming? The fruit of good and evil have come to full fruition. Remember what it says? As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. How were the days of Noah? Oh, demons came and had intercourse with women and gave birth. They're here. Listen to me now. Those hybrid beings are loose on earth right now while I'm talking to you. I've seen them. As the days of Noah were, Matthew says, Jesus said in Matthew 24, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So you study Genesis 6. The demons saw the children of men and took them. They gave birth. God told me to call them hybrids. He said, Nathan, no hybrids. They're here because we're in the end of the age. If you intend to get right with God, you better do it now. I'm, I'm serious. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't calcimate your heart. This is the final time. I'm serious about it. I can show you verse after verse after verse that catalogs the times and season we're living in to prove it's the last days. Number one, first, first sign of the last days, according to Jesus is Matthew 24, many false Christ shall arise and see many. I'd suggest we're there, don't you? There's this crazy confusion about what true Christianity is. Many false Christ shall arise and deceive many. Then it says there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Then it says there'll be some ethnic tension. Nations shall rise up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. All of that's, that's current right now, isn't it? What are we going to do? We're going to come clean before God. We're going to make sure our robes are white. We're going to, see, the, have you read the last book in the Bible? It says the white throne judgment. White in the Bible is always a type of purity. Let your garments always be white. How do we get, remember the Bible says, God's coming after bride without spot or wrinkle or what? Any such thing. How do you get spots and wrinkles out of clothes? Now, I'm not an expert on it myself. Scrubbing. How do you get wrinkles out? Heat and pressure. I suggest God's doing that for the church. Cleansing with scrubbing and heat and pressure. You ever felt it? He's, he's ironing out the wrinkles. Whew. I read the Bible. It says our God is a what? 
consuming fire. Come on. Consuming fire. Now, now let, let me just help you with some of this. This super seeker friendly stuff says to you, oh, you don't have to fear God. Everything's taken care of. Are you an idiot? <laughs> I'm more afraid of God than I am the devil. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. Well, brother, I, nope. I tell you what, guys, I don't have a coin in my pocket, but if you've got one, it's got a head and a tail, hasn't it? Yeah. See, if you just got one with all heads, you've got a counterfeit. Yes, God's a good God. Yes, God's a wonderful Abba Father, but there's also another side of God. We are way too familiar with the God we barely are aware of. But he's going to reintroduce himself to us. We got to get to know him. I'm telling you, here's what he told me to tell you. You better tell people I'm not near as easy as some preachers have made me out to be. I'm not near as easy to get along with. You say, well, Bobby, what does that mean? It means we got to do what he says or pay the consequence. The way we started this thing was, and Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And God said, all right, here's the results. Mm. You and I spent, what, $306 billion of your tax money last year on calamities in the United States. That's almost a billion dollars a day. Is that right? Now, you can Google it. They said, that's the money they could account for, $306 billion 2017 on calamities. I'd suggest we've been turned over to somebody. Don't you think? I'm going to tell you what the problem is. You want to know? It's in the Bible. I, I better read it because they, they'll think it's just a personal opinion. But you'll, you'll take God's word, won't you? Oh, yes, brother. <laughs> All right, let's see. We're talking about why in the world did it, we had to spend a billion dollars a day last year on calamities and on troubles and problems and stuff like that. Let, I'll, show, I'll show you the verse so you'll know it's in here. You ready? I'm, I have turned to 1 uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter uh, 4, uh, chapter 2, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. We're talking about what is the way to get this thing lined back out where we're not spending a billion dollars a day on calamity and disaster and despair. Here it is. Straight from the Bible. Uh, you ready? Maybe one of y'all want to read it, but look what it says. First of all, then, say top priority. Top priority. This is Paul instructing Timothy to tell the church. First, oh, well, let me read it first. First of all, then, I admonish and urge that petitions, prayers, and intercession and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all men. Verse 2, for kings and all who are in positions of authority or have high responsibility, that outwardly we may possess and pass a quiet and undisturbed life and inwardly a peaceable one in all godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. For such praying is good, verse three says, and right and is pleasing and acceptable to God, our Father. Wow. First of all, if you're going to lead a quiet, peaceable life, if you don't want to spend a billion dollars a day in calamity, what's the first thing you need to do? Pray for your president. That's her problem right now. The devil knows a house divided can't stand. Our nation is ripped down the middle and one of the chainsaws doing it is the media. But we're so, we're so thick-headed, we'll believe any garbage. You better believe this right here. If you want to live a quiet, peaceful life, pray for those in authority. I don't care whether you're Democrat, Republican, or some other thing. God cares less about that. What he wants you to do is be obedient. Yeah. You need to pray for your president. You say, I don't agree. I don't care what you do. You better agree with this. Yeah. Or you just keep forking out a billion dollars a day. I'm telling you, pray for those that are in authority, especially those that have high responsibility. Yeah. 
You can't get much higher responsibility than president of the United States in our nation. Now, you've never seen, you have never seen any human being in your life under as many word curses as Donald Trump. You hadn't. I am personally on a campaign to try to see that the modern day media gets tried for treason. I believe the modern day media should be tried for treason. What? I looked up Webster's de definition of treason an attempted throw, overthrow of a setting government. If the media is not guilty of that, would you please tell me what they are guilty of? Okay. Now you say, well, listen, I don't think we ought to mix uh, Christianity and politics. That's the problem. We supposed to be, we Christians are supposed to be running this theater. He's not going to hold the politicians and, and the media. He's going to hold us accountable. Here's your verse if you want it. You want a verse about that? Yes. Psalms 115, verse 16. Psalms 115, verse 16 said, The heavens of heavens, that belongs to your God, but this earth is your responsibility. What happens on this planet belongs to the Christians. God's not schizophrenic at all. He started his original intent with Genesis 126. Let us make man in our own image and let's give them kingdom authority. He's not digressed in that one bit. He's looking for some people that'll walk with him in such communion they take over this planet. She says, don't wait. <laughs> Isn't that something? I think we ought to shake ourselves and say, God, I've been Derek, 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 what? derelict. Derelict, easy for me to say. I, I saw every word but derelict. We've been derelict in our duty of taking care of this earth. The heavens of heavens, that belongs to God, but this earth he's put into our hands. Remember he said in Genesis 126, let's make man give them authority. Wow. Well, okay. But we can't do it if we're not dressed in Jesus. Who are you wearing? Hmm. I want to be dressed in Jesus, don't you? I want people to look at me and see Jesus. That's the only time you've got real authority. I love how that works. Can I take, give you a story? Yes! I was down in L.A. Y'all know where L.A. is. I was down there doing a conference, and they put me in a big hotel down there. But it just so happened, it was a hotel where they put the same uh, extreme Olympics. I mean, these guys that jump off motorcycles, they flip around backwards and give you a five. Those guys. <laughs> extreme Olympics. They had them in the same hotel. So I got my little briefcase. Here I am. I'm in the elevator. And I'm up against the wall like this with my, little, with my little briefcase going up. I think the 11th floor or something like that. So I got my face looking down at the, the floor. And just as the elevator door is closing, it opens up. And oh, Lord, my space is invaded. You, have you heard of the monster girls that sell the monster drinks? The monster drinks? They got a band of girls that are spokesmen for them. They jumped on the elevator. Whoa, good Lord. There's 14 or more of them. They jump in there. Listen, guys, they'd been off at one of their shoots. They, they didn't, listen, they didn't have no garb on the water shotgun. <laughs> Nearest thing to be a naked you've ever seen. These gals jumped on the elevator. I thought, oh, God. There I am with my briefcase like this. They're all over there. And one of them, you know, they're, they're young people just, just, and so they got to go like that. And, <laughs> One of them said, watch this. Hey, babe, are you here to party? Don't I look like a party animal? <laughs> she said, hey, babe, you here to party? I got my little briefcase. I said, oh, no, I'm here to tell people about Jesus. When I said the word Jesus inside that elevator, a girl about the third row in and the monster girls had a meltdown. Ah, 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 this is not who I am. I'm not supposed to be living this way. I'm a Christian And then she says, I think there's a whole bunch more just like me. I said, go get them. Bring them down there at the fountain. I'll come preach to them. <laughs> Woo! You talk about a variegated group. We get them down there. You couldn't have drug them in a church. We got them down there at the fountain, and I took off preaching about Jesus. 
talking about he's the way, the truth, and the life, talking about him giving life and more life abundant. I got hallelujahs and F-bombs at the same message. <laughs> Listen, wildest bunch you've ever seen, but I'll tell you some of them fell on their face giving their life to Jesus. See, what we gotta do is put on Jesus. Yeah. I tell you, if you're wearing him, you can get by just about anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is 100 years ago now. What I told you just a uh, little bit ago, this is about 100 years now. Y'all remember MC Hammer? Yeah. Can't touch this. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, this is in his heyday. I was going to a, a Benny Hinn conference thing. So I got my, I'm back in the elevator with my little bitty briefcase going to a Benny Hinn conference. I think we might have been in Detroit. And so just as the door started closing, MC Hammer hops in. He was hot as a rock then, boy. I mean, listen, all over the earth. That guy that was with him had that wavy hair sticking straight up. Anyway, so him and Hammer get in the, the, the elevator. Now, I'm not praying in tongues. I'm not shut up. In the, I'm just standing there. MC Hammer's right here. And here's what Hammer does. He goes, what is this? Then he said, why, it's the Holy Ghost, ain't it? I said, yes, it is. He said, that's real, ain't it? I said, it's the realest thing in the whole earth. He said, come down to my bus and tell my people. So I go with Hammer down to the, the parking area of that uh, thing, the Civic Center, and there's his bus. Woo! I got on that bus. I never smelled so much cologne in my life. <laughs> Everybody had a gold chain about this big around, a walking stick, gold walking stick, and we got to preach the gospel in there in Hammer's bus. He's preaching the gospel now. I'm telling you, they can realize if you're dressed in Jesus. You understand what I'm talking about? All right. That was funny. Don't you want enough God that people can feel it? Yeah. Now, I, listen, I, I'll give you a couple more stories. Plainly's in the morning. Hey, I'm going down to San Diego this week. Look it up on the web, you'll find it. They started meeting back there, we did, I think it might've been three years ago in January and it's still going every night. Wow. With Jeremy Nelson and uh, Miranda, uh, Elijah Revolution, it's, it's really wild. People come from all over the world now to get there, to see what's going on, so you ought to make it. It's not, I don't know, but anyway. <sighs> so there's stories, don't you like stories? Yes. I, I want us to really put on Jesus, Amen. dress up in him. Where people see past us just him and go, wow, that's what I want. That's what I want. Uh, one of my Ken folks before, when we were uh, lost, uh, she was into drug dealing. So I got converted, saved by the grace of God. And so I'm, I'm talking to my cousin. She was a beautiful woman, a deep, dark heart. So I'm talking to my cousin about receiving Jesus. My cousin, she mocked me. She said, you, you know, wimp, you wimped out, you got that crutch of Christianity, yeah, yeah, just turn me down. I thought, oh, Lord, I wish that would have, I wish her heart would have been smitten, but it wasn't. She mocked me, yeah, yeah, you know, tough, tough gal. Oh, but then she went to Walmart to do a drug deal, and the drug, the drug deal went bad, and the guy took a 357 Magnum shot her right here through the head and the bullet came out right here and then shot her again through this side and came out here and shot her one other place and she lived through it. Oh, wow. 357 Magnum with mushroom shells. Wow. Any one of them should have killed her. Yeah. Next time I saw her, she had, a, she had a jaw wired together. You know what she said? Tell me about this Jesus. I mean, you know, getting shot through the head, that's a pretty good wake-up call. <laughs> shot her through the head, shot her through the chest, going in this side, out the other, and some other place. Any one of those rounds should have killed her. But God had mercy on her. Isn't that something? She got saved. Amen. Yeah. A little disfigurement. But... See? I got some sad stories, too, about people that didn't respond. One of the men that uh, I'll tell you about this morning, and it'll be an incentive for you to dress up in Jesus. One of my friends I grew up with, he could have been a movie star, one of the most handsome men you could imagine. I'm telling you, Jimmy's his first name. I mean, 
just absolutely a beautiful man, built like you couldn't imagine. What happened? He goes down to mid-Texas and marries into the oil money. I'm talking about his, his wife's people had more money than you could stack in this room. Rich, rich, rich oil money out of the central Texas there in Abilene area. Anyway, so here's what happened. I'm driving to one of our meetings. I'm driving, and I'm going through the town I used to live in, Athens, Texas. And I hear a car going, ding, ding, ding. And I look over the window, and it's Jimmy. He's in a Corvette. I hadn't seen him in a long time. So anyway, we pull over at a little coffee shop there, and I get out and get and sit down in the car with Jimmy. Jimmy pops the, the console. There's all kind of liquor and cocaine. I said, nope, I don't do that anymore, man. I have given my life to Jesus. I said, I'm living for him, and it's wonderful. That's what you need. Here's what Jimmy said. He said, uh, if that's what you want, okay. You go your way, I'll go mine. Wow. I thought, oh, man. Uh, we say our goodbyes, get out of the car. I get in the truck. I go on to the meeting. I guess it might have been three weeks, maybe a little bit more or less. Jimmy goes back home. Remember, all the money in the world. Anything money could buy, he had it. So he goes back in, and he found out his wife was cheating on him. So he takes a shotgun, walks into a club, pumps it, shoots his wife's head off, and puts it back in his and blows his brains out. You go your way, I'll go mine. See, we don't have the luxury of not telling them. See, if I tell you to warn the wicked man of his wicked ways, and you don't do it, and he dies in his sins, his blood will I require at your hands. We've got to get the message out, no matter how hard it is for people to receive it. Right. Yeah. Jimmy's in hell while I'm talking to you right now. Wow. Man. Oh, you go your way and I'll go mine. The Bible said the way of the transgressor is hard. There's some people you can't talk to about God. You know that. But you can talk to God about them. <laughs> Prayer will chip away at the hardest heart. We've got to put on Jesus. Yes. We can't be so callous anymore to say, well, I'm just doing my own thing. I'm having a good time. Having fun. All of this is to make us pertinent soul winners. All of this leaving us on this planet is to take over this planet. That's what this thing's about. Ooh. Well, you say, well, Bobby, uh, I, 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 you know, I don't have that kind of gift. Yeah, you do. The giver is inside of you. The Holy Ghost of God will pour out of your lips the words you need to share with lost people if you'll be willing. If you're willing, he'll make you able. We're talking about who you're wearing. Look at Simon Peter. Simon Peter, before he was filled with the Holy Ghost, was a coward, wasn't he? Well, wait, let me reverse that just a moment. Remember at the Garden of Gethsemane? What, 600 Roman soldiers start starching in. What does Pete do? Pete jerks out an 18-inch dicara and ta -ta! He ain't a coward. He's stupid, but ain't a coward. <laughs> Cut the guy's ear off. Remember that? And Jesus said, no, Pete, put that up. Now, this is Jesus picked up Malchus's ear and stuck it back on. Yeah. That's loving, compassion, isn't it? Yeah. But see, and then Jesus, when he's being tried in front of Pontius Pilate, one of the little 18-year-old girls said to Peter, you're one of his disciples. What does Pete say? No, ah, oh, nope, not me. A little bit later she said, yes, yes, you are. You talk just like him. What does Pete say? I don't know him. Took a vow, an oath. He didn't know Jesus. But what happens? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches the strongest message you can find in the New Testament to the very people he once was afraid to be identified. You men by wicked hands have taken Christ and crucified him. Well, what turned him from a coward to a crusader? Holy Spirit. I think maybe our timidity is testimony to our carnality. Our timidity is testimony to our carnality. What does that mean? Proverbs 28 says the righteous will be what? He said the wicked are running. Nobody's even chasing. But the righteous will be as bold as a lion. So I think our timidity is testimony to how carnal we are. The righteous, say the righteous. Those in right standing with God who have put on Jesus, the righteous, will be as bold as a lion. The wicked's running, nobody's even chasing them. Okay. 
You say, now, Bobby, you really think we've had a wardrobe? I'm sure of it. But don't you want to wash yourself, anoint yourself, and put on the Lord Jesus? If there's any need in the church right now, it's recalibration. Revelations 2 said to the church in Ephesus, we've got to return back to our first love. That's the need of the hour. If you'll return back, you'll find everything you need in him. Aren't you glad? Well, good. Glad you're here. It's a beautiful baby. Thank God it took every mama. <laughs> no, that's, that's not very nice, but it's funny. And it's about, it's really true too, you know. Now, God, what do you do? Uh, fish butcher. What? I uh, cut fish for a living. Cut fish? There was a young man here who was in the meat market. This is Eureka. I found it. <laughs> what kind of fish do you cut? Uh, salmon. Salmon? Oh, man. Alvin. Oh, halibut, I like it. It's white. Oh, man. You didn't bring any samples. <laughs> oh, man, that's right. But that's wonderful. God bless you. I really mean that. I'll, I'll give you that book if I got one up here. This would be good. Let me get my water down. I've been multitasking. I put my throat lozenge in my water. You know, it kind of cuts out the middle man. You know what I mean? See, somebody come up with that hydration that sweetens your breath. See, you got to learn these things. <laughs> this, this is about how to raise that baby, okay? We all need to know how to raise those babies. I got two big old boys. I've got two sons, I've got five grandkids. My two boys are big. I mean, they're big. They're big. Got big old beards like this, and they love me. I never knew my dad. He died in a mental institution before I was born. But that doesn't keep you from knowing how to be a godly father. You know what I mean? Both my boys, big. They'll come and kiss me right on the face. I can, I, I, I can come in down there to the office in Texas, got a bed. I lay down. Them two boys will run and jump in bed with me. One of them's 52 and, uh, well, 54, and the other one's 47 yesterday. They'll come jump in the bed with me. It looks like a buffalo waller. It's, yeah. But they love me. They, they, they're just, I'm telling you guys, we don't have an excuse for how we're living. I don't care what society's done to you. God can heal it. Amen. He can, t and by your stripes, you know, by his stripes were healed. The scars is where you can uh, get authority for healing. The very place you were wounded gives you authority to heal in that arena. Amen. Yeah. What is a scar? It's a proof that a wound has been healed. Mm -hmm. I got one other thing. I am just, listen, this is me. I was invited off to Washington, D.C. to speak in an all-black church. Sunday morning, 25 pastors on the platform. Helicopter for the president right across the street. I'm invited to preach. Oh, Lord. Glory to God. So I'm, I'm saying, God, I don't have the message. He said, I got it. I said, give it to me. He said, I will at the time. <laughs> if you're a preacher, you know that ain't what you want to hear. I said, God, I'm telling you, please give me the message. He said, I will at the time. I said, it's time. <laughs> Here's what happened. Now, don't get mad at me. Listen to the thing. I come out, and the thing's whole, all totally full. And most of them are in, the mili the, most of them are in uh, political arenas, judicial arenas, uh, career people. Very immaculately dressed, very beautiful people. I'm the only white person there. So I get to the podium, open my Bible, and the Lord said, here's the message. I said, oh, Okay. Here's the message. You ready? He said, tell him, oh, I'm sorry. I won't be able to preach here. You're too white for me. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm the only white guy there. <laughs> when I said that, have you ever heard 25 pastors gasp? <laughs> it's quite audible. 
Like, oh, Lord, what have we done? I said, oh, God, this, this Lord, these guys stiffen like poles out there. I said, God, that can't, that, he said, nope, say it again. I said, I'm so sorry. I won't be able to preach here today. You're too white for me. These guys are up like this now. They're wondering like, what in the world is this guy going to do? All the way over there in a catacomb, all the way over there. I don't know a long way over there. I heard it. I heard it. Thank God. I hear somebody going, glory to God. I seize it. That's what she said. <laughs> glory to God. I seize it. Here she comes. She's about 80 pounds. The biggest thing about her is a black hat. And she's dancing through that. Glory to God, I seize it. Glory to God, I seize it. She made her trek across there, little old thing, old as she could be, screaming, glory to God, I seize it, throwing her handkerchief around. Every one of the 25 pastors fall out on the floor and Holy Ghost broke out. Holy Ghost broke out. Wow. What does that mean? It means God's tired of you trying to be somebody you're not. Be who you are. You understand that? Well, uh, no. She saw it. Now, thank God she saw it. <laughs> I was blind as bad. I didn't see it. You know. I didn't like what I was seeing. You know. Can you believe that though? What, you want one more message and I'm through. Now, I'm from the South. You figured that, didn't you? And so here's what happened. I'm going to a big church. Uh, uh, denominational church that doesn't, wasn't, is not warm to the Holy Ghost. I said, God, why are you sending me there? He said, they need what you have. I go, okay. Now, I'm going to the meeting. It's a Sunday morning. Y'all know what uh, 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 Cracker Barrel is? Yeah. Cracker Barrel, they got them down there. And the Lord said, pull in Cracker Barrel. I said, I'm not hungry. He said, that wasn't what you told. I, so I put my blinker on. I turned into Cracker Barrel. Now, this is going to be good. And I'm going, I thought, well, at least I can go wash to the washroom. So I'm, I'm walking to the washroom in Cracker Barrel in, in, in this town. And as I walk by one of the displays there, a fish swung around like this. It's called Billy Big Mouth Bass. And he started singing, take me to the river. God said, buy that fish. I said, God, it's $29.95. He said, buy the fish. So I said, I'm putting it on the ministry's credit card. That's what I said. I get up there at the checkout counter and buy Billy Big Mouth Bass. I thought, I don't even like, that's okay. He said, put it in the briefcase. I said, I'll leave it in the car. He said, put it in the briefcase. So I put Billy Big Mouth Bass in the briefcase and I'm saying, God, what are we going to say to these people? They, he said, you've got it. I'm trying to tell him I ain't got it. I get there and here's it, here it is. He said, get Billy Big Mouth up. I stepped to the podium, didn't carry the Bible, carried Billy Big Mouth Bass. I turned speaker on, Billy Big Mouth wheels around and goes, take me to the river. And then you're like, song it plays. And I played Billy Big Mouth twice and you can't imagine what happened. Altars filled with people crying out for the river of the Holy Ghost. Out of your innermost being will flow a river of living water. And all I had to do was just keep batteries in Big Mouth. Yeah. <laughs> do you understand God's got this? He is in charge. You say, well, now I'm gonna tell you my key to success. I'll tell you why I get invitations this thick every day. Because I'll do what he asked me to do. I may stumble and bumble at it, but I'm going to give it a shot. He, here's, here's my advice to you. Swift and complete obedience. Do as quickly as you can, as thoroughly as you can, anything he asks you to do. He said half-hearted obedience is nothing but cloak rebellion. So he, he'll, listen, whatever he says to do, do it. Now that sounds so good. Did I tell you when I had to? I'm over there with Rick Joyner and, and Jack Deere and those guys in Europe. And they said, oh, Bobby, be careful. Most influential man in Europe is here. 
and he's hostile to the Holy Ghost. I am a man of confidence. I said, oh, don't worry. Bring him right down here to the front. God will make a firm believer out of him. They brought him right down here. He looked like the most influential man in all Europe. Dressed with, watch him little scarves that got stuck down here. And it matched it. And there he and his wife are. There's my team, or the guy, Jack Deere and Rick Joyner and Paul Kane. And there they are on the front row. There's, I'm the guy preaching. There's the most influential man in Europe. So, you know me, I don't mind confronting. So I said to him, sir, I understand you don't believe in the prophetic. He said, not one bit. In perfect English. A gentleman, not one bit. I said, well, before this service is over, you'll be a firm believer in the prophetic. He said to me, I sincerely doubt that. My team wrote, "Mm." (laughs) here it is. Go ahead and preach the whole message. We're at the end of the message. God said, call him down here. I said, I don't think I want him here. (laughs) He said, but don't, don't look at his wife. I said, okay, sir, would you and your wife come? So they come. There's his wife on his arm. So he's standing right there in front of me. And I said, what we already knew, you don't believe in the prophetic. He said, no, not one bit. I said, well, before it's over, I said, God, it's about over. <laughs> then the Lord said, you can look at his wife. So I turned my eyes and looked at her. She fell out in the Holy Ghost right there. Wham! Just out. Now it's just me and him at about 8,000 eyes. <laughs> The Lord said, I got something for you to do. I thought it'd be about reconstructing the Euro, about reconnecting the European market. That wasn't what it was. God said, will you do it? I said, yes, I will. He said, I want you to lean over and nibble his ear. (laughs) My mouth got so dry, my tongue stuck up in the roof of my mouth. My knees were weak and my voice sounded like a girl. Sir, 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 I feel like I'm supposed to do something. (laughs) These boys are in trouble now. (laughs) So he said to me, do whatever you feel like God's told you to do. So I rotate his shoulder to get a shot at his ear. I, I start just like that and on the way, Before my lips got to his ear, the Lord said, and I mean really gobble it. (laughs) That's what he said. So I take the guy's ear in my mouth and out of my mouth came these words, just flowing like a a geyser. This guy falls in the floor. He's screaming, yes, yes, I believe anything you've got to say. I said, get up. (laughs) We got him up. I said, what in the world is it? He said, oh, what you don't know, I think he said two months ago, my wife went to a charismatic meeting, was impacted by the Holy Ghost, he says. Says for two months or however long it was since the meeting, every night she'd come, I'd go to bed, she'd come, make herself ready for bed, sit on the edge of the bed, roll over twice, take my ear in her mouth and woo me with the same words you just used. He said, I'll believe anything you've got to say. Now, you can't go to the seminary and get a degree on that. Can you imagine? Listen, I've said, God, please don't ever do this again. You know, you're supposed to have integrity and you're supposed to, there's supposed to be a certain ambiance about you, you know, but nibbling on, yep. But that's the truth. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'll tell you what he said. You can do anything in this region you want to do. See, the very thing they thought would drive him away, drug him in. See? You say, well, Bobby, I'm not like you. You could be. You could be. You say, does Jesus really come to see you? Knocked on the door and stepped in the room. Nearly killed me. Yeah. When I say I have an encounter with Jesus, I mean it. More real than Wendy right here. Yeah. Yeah. You want those kind of experiences? Clean your heart. Make your life ready and expect it. If it happens to one, it should happen to everyone. Because God is no respecter of persons. 
That's how I used to get all my encounters. I'd find them in the Bible and I'd get God in the hammerlock. <laughs> all right, you're no respecter person. If you spoke to Moses face to face as a friend communicates. So I had God in the hammerlock. <laughs> and then he said to me, are you willing to do what he did to get what he got? Yeah. Remember when God came down on the mountain, cleared his throat? Two million Jews took off running that away. <laughs> Don't ever let him speak to us like that again. You go get the word. And Moses goes up on a mountain trembling and vibrating with the presence of God. Are you willing to do what he did to get what he got? If you are, you'll get what he got. Because he's no respecter of persons. All righty. Good. What do you do, this guy right here? What do you do? Pipe fitter. Pipe fitter? Yeah, I worked at uh, NIPAC one time and I worked in maintenance. That's what we did. But, you know, it was crazy. <laughs> They, you know, you're supposed to know what you're doing. You're supposed to read off of these blueprints. Yep. You know, mine look, no, anyway. I wasn't very good at pipe fitting, but it, it's an art. You know, they, anyway, that's where I was at when I surrendered to preach NIPAC Incorporated. <laughs> they was teaching me computers. They sent me to Dallas to computer school and the computer was as big as that stage right there. <laughs> Floppy disk was about like this, about the size of cardboard box. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, oh Lord. Well, let's see what God will do, okay? He'll heal everyone in this room if you'll trust him. You believe that? It says the Bible, he healed them all. He healed them all. There is no disease he can't heal. Genesis 18, 14 says, is anything too hard for God? Luke 1, says, with men it is impossible, but with God, nothing is impossible. One thing he's going to heal is fragmented families. I roll out across you if you wanted. Joel 2.25. Joel 2.25, God said, I will restore. Yes. What will he restore? Everything the canker worm consumed. Listen, somebody's going to get back their fortune. That's what he said. God loves to restore. Greatest evidence of restoration in the Bible is when Mephibosheth got back everything that was his granddaddy's. The economist says there's no way to even calculate what kind of wealth transfer that was. Wow, it happened in one day. Joel 3.25, 2.25, I will restore. Don't you want him to restore? What's up? That said, well, I can't sleep with you yelling. How are you? You doing good? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're wonderful. I bought my little granddaughter a tutu. She was just a baby. She's eight years old now. Oh, Lord. She called me. She said, Papa Preach, I've given up ballet. It hurts my toes. She said, but don't worry. I've taken up guitar. The guitar. That's what she says. Uh, well, anyway, let's, let's pray for you, okay? Now, I promise you, you don't need me to touch you. You need him to touch you. God is busy now cutting out the middle man. There is no mediator between God and man except that man, Christ Jesus. And he's able to heal you right where you're at. I really mean that. So I'm going to pray that you'll be healed and you'll give God glory for it. And you'll give testimony to the fact this was wrong, but now it's okay. Don't you want that? I'm telling you, God can do it. Father, I want to thank you for the fact that you can do anything. That nothing's too difficult for you, nothing's too hard for you, and you're willing to do it. You're willing to save to the uttermost all that come to you through Christ. Lord, you paid for our sins and our sicknesses. And so, Lord, right now, we call in that, that, that pavement right now for every sick person in this room. We pray that this would be the day, this would be the moment that they're born again, they're saved, they're healed, they're delivered. I pray right now there'll not be one single person walk out of these doors without Christ. I pray that every sick person will be well. I hold you to your word. By your stripes, we are healed. And I call in that healing right now. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to touch their body. It says in the word of God, she felt in her body she was healed from the plague. Lord, I want a touch from heaven so the people feel, they experience a healing touch. So bless this place. I pray that the word of God will get out in this region. I pray Mark 2, 1. It was noised abroad that he was in the house. There was not room enough to receive him. No, not so much as about the door. So Lord, let the word get out that you're in the house and draw the people to get the needs met. 
in Jesus' name. Say, I receive what I need from Jesus Christ. He is completely perfect. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He is the Savior. He's King of glory. Oh, boy. We're going to get a new appreciation of Jesus. A lot of people see him as Bethlehem's baby, which he was, but he's not now. A lot of people see him as a suffering lamb upon a tree, which he was, but he's not now. Next time your eyes behold him, you'll see him with the eyes as a flame of fire, hair as white as wool, feet like fine brass. You'll see him as a risen king. That's who he is right now. And he's able to tip his scepter towards you. He wants you to be like Esther when Esther approached her husband and he says, anything you need is yours. Wow. If I had a word just to describe God, it would have to be extravagant. Everything he does, he does bigger and better than we expected. Extravagant. Well, this is a good season for you guys. I'm serious. This is a good season for you. It's a transitional season for you and the church. You are gonna go out and bring in. You'll go out with the message and you'll bring in with new concepts and different things. The church will flourish more as you go out than, than, than you can imagine. It's like a bee going out, bringing back in different nectar and it, it sweetens a whole hive. Don't you like honey? Why, sure, Bobby. <laughs> Deuteronomy 20, 32, what? 32, 13 says he siphoned honey from the rock. Yeah. That's right. You believe it? Yeah. I, I want somebody, somebody get a hold of this virtual reality thing and train people from stories in the Bible. Get a hold of some of these, who's these guys that fly them? Who was the guy who flew some kind of thing, put a car in orbit last week? Watch his name. I don't know. Who? Elon. Elon. Get a hold of Elon and tell him I want to talk to him. Somebody's got to start financing, putting the Bible stories on these virtual reality goggles and using the mechanics of the Avatar film. It'll train people just like that into the ministry. But see, they're, they're doing a, that chick going, Alexis. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> whatever, you know. No wonder she won't answer me. I'm... Have you ever asked her if she knows Jesus? Hey, I did. Guess what she says? I think such an important question should be asked to a human, not a computer. Yeah. yeah. But we got to use this technology. So, somebody, and I'm serious. Get a hold of some of these guys, whoosh, whatever they are, Google and whatever's the other one. You know, you know, some of these people, Apple guy, they build him something look like a flying saucer out there. Some of these guys are supposed to, they want them, I want to change humanity. Yeah, get a goggle. This virtual reality is the next seminary. So some of you tech people, help me. I want to get a hold of them. The mechanics of that Avatar film, they can take the stories from the Bible and make them come alive. You can put it on and, you know, you'll be walking with Jesus on the water. Yeah. And there was lightning school. I'm telling you, is there anybody in here that works for them people? Is there? Okay, I want Samsung, Sung Sam or somebody, somebody get me in touch with these people. It's going to be the most revolutionary thing the church has seen in your life for training people. Strap on them goggles, put a Bible story on. See, but now we go, well, I hadn't really got time to read all this. You can, you can get it both, both gates, eye gate and ear gate. Well, halibut. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm through. Uh, Pastor, you want to do anything? 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like breaking up a pool ball, you know, there's everywhere. You know, there's, yeah. Over here, over yeah. there, over yeah. there. We're going to take an offering, we're going to do that. So let's have the guys come down. And when they take an offering, can you share a story? Oh yeah, okay, you got to hear it. Jeez. And I don't care what story, it's all going to be amazing. All right, we're going to receive an offering for Bobby. And uh, if you guys want to make your checks, check, make your checks out to Convergence House of Prayer. If you want to give, we could do that on uh, Push Pay, yes, Push Pay offering Bobby, Bobby Connor. And then there's, uh, are you still going to sign some books? You're going to sign some books. So we're going to pray real quick, and then I'm going to have Bobby kind of close with one of his stories as the Spirit of God leads him, and uh, we'll see where it goes. So Lord, thank you for Bobby. Thank you for the, this, the, the, the prophet that you brought here. And God, thank you for his ministry. Thank you for all that you're doing. I pray that we get that kind of boldness that he has, and just be absolutely obedient to everything you're saying, Lord. We just ask that you would bless this offering in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys go ahead, pass that. Bobby, why don't you close this with a story? And uh, one more. I don't know. I gave him the mic back, so you know. But you know, you guys want to hear one more story, right? I mean, this is an incredible faith builder. So there you go. Here we go. Uh, I, I, got, I got this one. Oh, you got it. Here we go. Down in Texas, that's where I'm from, there, there's a man called R.G. Letourneau. And R.G. Letourneau baffled the economists because he gave away 90% of his wealth and lived on 10% built a mega business. So the economy said, how can you do that? How can you give away 90% and thrive on 10%? And he's a country boy. He said, well, I shovel it out and God shovels it in, but he uses a bigger shovel. You can't outgive God. I'm telling you, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. I'm telling you, it is imperative now that we learn how to turn the economy around. And the way to do it is give. I really mean it. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, press down, shake it together, and what? Running over. One of the names of God is El Shaddai. The God that does for you what you can't do for yourself. Now, whether you believe it or not, God is looking for people he can trust with wealth. Looking for people he can trust with wealth. It says, Deuteronomy 8, 18, it is God that gives you power to get wealth. One of the things he'll do, he'll start telling you things, secrets, strategies that brings breakthrough. And you can get catapulted above the rest of the people because you got a word from heaven. Look at Daniel. I like Daniel, don't you? Look, he got a word from heaven. And pretty soon the king says, they ain't no God but the one he's worshiping. That's pretty wild, isn't it? I like Daniel 2, There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. There's a verse the Bible said, he'll give you witty inventions. Will you translate it? Smart plans that work out. God can give you smart plans that work out. Yes, sir. You say, well, how does he do it? Impressions, dreams. He'll talk to you. What? John 10, 3 said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He'll talk to you. You say, well, if you are saved, you've already heard his voice. That was not the devil that said, hey, you better get saved. That's not his language. That's Jesus' language. You understand that? So you can't hear him, can't you? That's good. Study your ancestors. There's a treasure and a trophy in the middle of your ancestral line. Okay? Well, okay. Okay. Good. Some runaway granddaughter is going to come home. Some grandmother has been crying over this daughter. She's somewhere up here between uh, here and Coos Bay, Oregon. She's run away, not living like she should. God's going to bring her back in. There's somebody in this section right here. You're going to bring back in a runaway daughter, a granddaughter. Because God's heard the grandmother's prayer and he surrounded her and protected her. And now he's going to put a, a hook in her jaw and bring her back home. When she comes back in, what you need to do is just embrace her, love her. And I'll tell you what will happen. That'll, that'll pull away all, this, all the slime and stuff that's tried to attach itself to her. She's somewhere. She hitched a ride with some guys going off the west coast up through there. Well, she's somewhere now outside of Coos Bay, Oregon. I call you in. Come on home. Come on home. She's wondering, will they love me? Answers yes. Yes. So that's, that'll be good. I, 
I, well, anyway, you want her name? Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Well, anyway, she'll, she'll come home and I want you to receive her. And God will make it as though it never happened. God will make it as though it never happened. That's what it means to be justified. Well, we call her back in. This is the time that it's time for the ring and the robe. You get a ring and a robe, identity and authority. Good. Ooh. Lord, thank you. You say, well, you, you re- no, I know she's coming home. I, I expect you to get a call within two or three days asking, can I come home? And, uh, isn't that something? I think one of the names when she was a little girl, she called grandmama, sweet mama, sweet mama. Isn't that something? They, that my grandkids called me Papa Preach. They called the other grandpa Papa Momo. He <laughs> he rode them on the lawnmower, you know. So, listen. God bless you. God bless this church. I'll see you at the book table. I want you to do something. I want you to fall fall wildly in love with Jesus. If you've got any people down there at San Diego, we'll be there uh, Thursday and Friday down at the the uh, Times and Seasons conference and. We'll be somewhere, well, we'll be at Morningstar the next week for their uh, conference. But then we'll be in Hong Kong, Philippines. Oh, Lord. It's wonderful. Share the word about the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, God told me, he said, he told me, said, I'm opening the heavens and I'm going to rain down my glory on the Philippines. I th- and I hadn't been to the Philippines in years. Before you could turn around, we got an invitation. And he's been here. You've been there, hadn't you? And so I got an invitation to be there in whatever March. Uh, So now I'm on the way to the Philippines. That'll be fun. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, But see, God does that. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm at the book table. Here. Thank you.